Our discussion of space groups would be somewhat incomplete if we didn't take a little time to talk about the implications of space group symmetries on certain types of physical properties. All physical properties depend in some way on the symmetry of a crystal. For example, the conductivity of a material could be isotropic, as it is in a cubic crystal, or it could be anisotropic, as it is in many lower symmetries. But the physical properties I want to talk about in this lecture are ones whose very existence depends on the symmetry of the crystal. A crystal that exhibits second harmonic generation will double the frequency of incoming light. The most familiar application of this might be something like a green laser pointer. So there's a laser crystal inside that laser pointer that produces infrared light, and then you use a second crystal, a frequency doubling crystal, to half the wavelength and double the frequency, and that produces green light. Another important property is piezoelectricity. And a piezoelectric crystal is one that, if you apply a mechanical stress to it, you develop a macroscopic electric dipole on that crystal. You have a positive and a negative phase of the crystal. There's also something called the converse piezoelectric effect, where you apply an electric field to this kind of crystal, and it changes its shape. So piezoelectric materials are used in a variety of applications, in sonar systems, in ultrasound imaging, where they convert you know, a mechanical pulse to an electrical signal. The opposite case can be used for fine control of motion. For example, to control the tip of an atomic force microscope. A crystal that is pyroelectric is one where there can be a net spontaneous electric dipole to the overall crystal. We're all familiar with the idea of a polar molecule. And if you have a crystal of polar molecules, those dipole moments might cancel out or they might add constructively. And to add constructively, we have to have a pyroelectric crystal, and that requires a certain kind of symmetry. If we can reverse the direction of the dipole moment with an external field, a pyroelectric crystal would be considered a ferroelectric. Uh, ferroelectrics have a lot of important applications. Optical activity, this is a property of chiral molecules. Uh, you know, it would rotate the polarization of plane polarized light. But not only can you have chiral molecules in solution, but you can have a crystal that's chiral. And chiral crystals are said to be enantiomorphic. And you can have two macroscopic crystals whose structures are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. So all of these properties that we just talked about the most important symmetry element is the inversion center. So we can divide all crystals into two categories. Those that have an inversion center are said to be centrosymmetric, and those that do not are non-centrosymmetric. And all of the properties we talked about on the previous slide only occur in non-centrosymmetric crystals. Well, how can we look at a space group and know whether it's going to be centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric? The first thing to realize is that it depends on the point symmetry of the crystal. The Brave lattice is irrelevant to determining whether a space group is centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric. And then when we focus down on the point symmetry operations, we'll see that we create an inversion center, of course, when we have an inversion center. So a space group like P1 bar would obviously be a centrosymmetric crystal. But then there are other kinds of operations that show up in the point group name that inherently generate inversion centers. And those are rotoinversion axes, where the axis is an odd number, either one bar, which is just the inversion center, or three bar, and this image here shows how, when we have three-fold rotoinversion axis, that we generate an inversion. This is not true for a rotoinversion axis that has an even number, like a two-bar, a four-bar, or a six-bar axis. The other combination of symmetry elements that creates an inversion center is a rotation axis with a perpendicular mirror if the rotation axis is an even number. So here we see a fourfold rotation axis, 
and a perpendicular mirror. And you can see that combination creates an inversion point where the axis and the mirror plane intersect. Now, when we sort all the space groups into those which possess those elements that give an inversion center and those that don't, we can sort our 32 crystallographic point groups into 12 centrosymmetric point groups and 20 non-centrosymmetric point groups. And that division is shown here in this table. Notice that we have both centrosymmetric and non-centrosymmetric point groups in every crystal system. And so now let's drill down and focus a little bit more on just the non-centrosymmetric point groups. So we're going to take the centrosymmetric ones away, and then we're going to look at these non-centrosymmetric ones, and we're going to go back to those physical properties that I talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Now it turns out that those various properties, piezoelectricity, pyroelectricity, optical activity, not all non-centrosymmetric crystals are capable of delivering each of those various physical properties. And so this Venn diagram, which is modeled after an image that appeared in this very influential paper by Hossimani and Poppelmeyer back in the late 1990s, illustrates the point groups that are capable of each type of physical property. So we see that only here in the middle, the point groups 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 deliver on all four circles of this Venn diagram. They can be piezoelectric, they could be pyroelectric, they could show optical activity, and they can be chiral. We see also that the symmetry requirements for piezoelectricity and second harmonic generation are the same. If, if a crystal can do one, it, it can do the other. And all of the non-centrosymmetric point groups, with this one exception, the cubic point group 432, are capable of second harmonic generation and piezoelectricity. The blue circle shows those point groups which can uh, crystallize into chiral crystals, and we call these the enantiomorphic space groups. And then the green circle shows those point groups which can uh, rotate plane polarized light. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the physical properties, but this is a good point for me to also mention that when we are tasked with determining the crystal structure of a new compound, let's say you grow crystals in the lab and you want to figure out their crystal structure, a very important step is determining the correct space group symmetry. And that is not always completely unambiguous, but we can use these uh, physical properties sometimes to help us in that decision. So if a material exhibits second harmonic generation, that tells us that it has to be a space group that has one of these point groups. If a crystal exhibits optical activity, that means it has to be one of the point groups that's in this green circle. Okay, let's now take a little bit closer look at some of the circles on this Venn diagram. Let's start with the polar crystals that are capable of pyroelectricity and ferroelectricity. So all of the point groups that have this property are said to be polar space groups, and space group is polar if it has a polar axis. What is a polar axis? Well, that is a rotation axis whose ends are not equivalent. So think about it this way. If we have, let's say, a fourfold rotation axis, we start with the point group four. That would have a polar axis. We could say that the top and the bottom of the axis are in equivalent by symmetry. If we add a vertical mirror plane, that doesn't change the picture at all. But once we put a twofold axis perpendicular to it, or a mirror plane perpendicular to it, now those symmetry operations turn the top of the axis into the bottom. And so it's no longer going to be a polar axis. So that means we can rule out any point groups that have twofold axes or mirror planes perpendicular to the main rotation axis. And we can also rule out any point groups that have rotoinversion axes. One of the ways you can recognize a polar space group is if you look in the international tables at the various Wyckoff sites. Because there's no unique point in a polar space group, right? Think about point group 2MM, you know, this would be C2V in the Schoenfle system. There is no one point that's invariant. 
any point on the twofold axis is going to be invariant in that point group. So there's not a unique point. And so there won't be any fixed points in, amongst the Wyckoff positions. There won't be anything that says this atom is at zero, 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 or half, zero, half. Uh, you might have an atom that's at zero, zero, z, you know, but there's always going to be at least one variable in the coordinates of every single Wyckoff site. And as I said before, it's only the crystals that fall into this group that can exhibit pyroelectricity and ferroelectricity. And to better understand that, let's just look at the schematic. Let's say that we had a collection of four molecules. They're polar molecules. Think of this molecule as HCl if you want. It's got a positive and negative end. Now, if I were to take that molecule and now carry out all of the symmetry operations of fourfold row to inversion axis, I would generate these other molecules with this orientation. Now, if you look at this image for a minute, you will see that there are no inversions here. But the dipole moments of the four molecules are going to cancel out when we add them up. And this is the idea of how you can have a non-centrosymmetric crystal, but it would not be a polar crystal. So coming back to our Venn diagram, that means we can rule out all of the space groups that have multiple rotation axes. So 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 2, 6, 2, 2, so on and so forth. We can rule out the point groups that have roto-inversion axes, like the 4-bar, the 6-bar, uh, and, and these others here. And then we're just left with these 11 point groups, those that have just a proper rotation axis, and then those with mirrors parallel to that rotation axis. Let's next look at the enantiomorphic or chiral crystals. So to understand those, we have to make a distinction between symmetry operations that are proper and those that are improper. So the proper operations are rotation axes, screw axes, and translations. Whereas the improper operations have either a component of an inversion or a mirror. And so that encompasses both rotor inversion axes and glide planes. Now maybe the best way to think about the differences between these two operations is that if you take an object in real life, like that coffee mug that might be sitting on your desk or your left hand, you can rotate it, you can translate it, you can move it from one side of the desk to the other. And you could do both. And if you did both, that would be a screw axis. But you can't take a real object and physically invert it. I can't, by twisting my arm or whatever I do, I can't make my left hand be inverted. I also can't create a mirror image in real space of uh, that object. And so that's how we distinguish these two types of operations. Now the relevance is that the proper operations will retain the handedness of a chiral object, like a chiral molecule, whereas the improper operations will invert or the handedness, so we'll get a, an object that has the opposite handedness. And so if you think about it for a minute, if you want to have a crystal, and you want to have all of the molecules in that crystal be chiral, then you are limited to space groups that contain only proper operations. And so we come back to our Venn diagram, you see we can eliminate all of the point groups that have mirror planes, and of course all of the point groups that have a roto-inversion axis. And then we're just left with those in this blue circle. Among the space groups that are in this enantiomorphic circle, we can further subdivide those into two different categories. Uh, and that is shown on this slide. So here we see that 65 of the 230 space groups contain only proper symmetry operations. Those are all shown here, and we call those the Sankey space groups. And you can see we find those in every single crystal system. Furthermore, we have enantiomorphic pairs of space groups, like P41 and P43. These space groups are inherently chiral, uh, and they're classified as chiral space groups. 
So what does this mean? Well, it means that if we were to have uh, a substance, let's say a chiral molecule, maybe an amino acid, and we were going to grow crystals of it, and we had an enantiopure sample, so only the right-handed molecule, and let's say that it crystallized in space group P41. Okay, that's a chiral space group. That's all good. Now, if we were to repeat that experiment, but now grow crystals with the left-handed enantiomer, we might get a crystal structure that was very similar. In fact, the crystal would be a mirror image of the one we grew the first time. But the symmetry now would be different. It would be P43. So these ones that are in blue, it means that you get a different space group if you were to crystallize molecules of the opposite handedness. Now, what about something like P42? That's not shown in blue. So if you were to crystallize the right-handed molecules, you get one kind of crystal, would have P42 symmetry. If you were to crystallize the molecules that have the left-handedness, you would get the mirror image. It would be a chiral crystal still, but its base group symmetry would still be P42. Okay, so that's the difference between these inherently chiral space groups shown in blue, and then the ones that permit crystallization of chiral molecules. And in general, these ones shown in gray will also be chiral to some extent if you find that as the space group symmetry. Summarizing that here, if we were to grow crystals of a chiral molecule that is a pure enantiomer, we must get a crystal whose space group symmetry belongs to one of those 65 Sonki space groups, unless we had some kind of disorder in it. It also turns out that sometimes we can grow crystals of achiral molecules and end up with chiral crystals. So they arrange themselves in such a way that they create chirality. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the SiO2 polymorph quartz. But most of the time when we grow crystals of achiral molecules, we're going to get achiral crystals. Now, those could either have a centrosymmetric space group or they might form in a non-centrosymmetric space group, but one of the ones that's outside of our Venn diagram of enantiomorphic crystals. If you were to grow crystals from a racemic mixture, a solution that had a racemic mixture of both enantiomers, oftentimes we'll get an achiral crystal. So they'll pack in such a way that you get a space group symmetry that doesn't permit chirality. But sometimes you might just grow a mixture of left and right-handed crystals. And the last thing to talk about is this green circle, which shows those point groups that can give optical activity. Now, not surprisingly, that includes all of the point groups that are enantiomorphic. Everything that's in the blue circle is also in the green circle. But there are four point groups which do give optical activity, but are themselves not chiral. So what's going on with that? Well, basically it comes down to the fact that if you had one of those crystals, let's say a crystal with MM2 symmetry, and you were to pass plane polarized light through it, depending on the direction that the light passes through, you could rotate the light either to the left or to the right. If that were a molecular crystal and you were to dissolve that crystal in solution, now you would lose the fixed orientation of the molecules that you have in the crystal, and that would no longer rotate plane polarized light. Whereas molecules that crystallize in any of these enantiomorphic space groups, even their solutions would be optically active.